This 26-year-old male sustained a gunshot wound to the left thigh. He was treated emergently with revascularization and fasciotomies. He was transferred to our regional trauma center one week after injury with extensive lower leg myonecrosis, renal failure, and sepsis. An open knee disarticulation was performed as a life-saving procedure to remove the necrotic tissue of the lower leg. He is now stable and returns to surgery for definitive transfemoral amputation. After a sterile prep and drape, a sterile tourniquet is applied high on the operative field. Diameter of the limb is measured at the area of the planned bone cut. Note the band sealing off the open area. Incision lines are drawn for an equal anterior and posterior flap technique. They are designed so that if a proximal extension is needed, they will be in line with the more proximal incisions from his revascularization. Both flaps have a length that is equal to one half the diameter of the limb at the level of the planned bone cut plus one centimeter. The incisions are made in a decisive fashion through the skin, subcutaneous tissue, and the fascia to avoid feathered edges of tissue. Immediately, the area of the vessels near Hunter's Canal is identified. From this point, the incision is carried anteriorly and laterally through the muscle down to the bone. The posterior lateral incision is made through the skin, subcutaneous tissue, and fascia. The posterior medial incision is made through the skin, subcutaneous tissue, and fascia. Because the knee joint was open and potentially colonized, the synovial tissue is removed to minimize the risk of infection. Dissection is done between the fascia of the quadriceps muscle and the synovial tissue in order to leave the synovial tissue with the distal femur and make certain that it is removed with the amputation specimen. The dissection continues between the quadriceps tendon and the synovial tissue. The dissection is carried down to the femur anteriorly and then laterally and the periosteum is divided. The quadriceps muscle is elevated up off the femur. A large retractor holds up the quadriceps muscle to expose the femur. A cob elevator is used to free up the tissue circumferentially around the femur. The oscillating saw is used to divide the femur perpendicular to its long axis. Saline is used to cool the saw blade and prevent thermal damage to the bone. The distal attachment of the adductor muscle is demonstrated. This tissue must be preserved and dissected off the femur to be used for the adductor myodesis. The skin and subcutaneous tissue is dissected distally off the adductor fascia to better visualize the adductor. The adductor tissue is dissected off the femur The adductors are transected distally after preserving adequate length for the adductor myodesis. In the posterior medial area, the vessels can be transected safely at this level as the tourniquet prevents bleeding and blood loss. The vessels are then dissected, free, divided, and a large femoral artery and both accompanying veins are clamped for later ligation. The posterior muscle and tissues are dissected cleanly with the amputation knife. Vessels are dissected approximately and clamped.
the artery and two veins are shown. A stick tie of O-silk suture is used first. The stick tie will not slip off or pulse off the end of the vessels, but it does leave a hole that could bleed or lead to a pseudoaneurysm or an arterial venous fistula. A free tie is placed proximally to the stick tie. The proximal free tie prevents bleeding at the site of the stick tie and minimizes the chance of AV fistula or pseudoaneurysm from forming. The sciatic nerve has already branched into the tibial nerve, the perineal nerve, and the sural nerve. These nerves are dissected proximally. The tissue between the tibial and perineal branches is dissected up to the area of the common sciatic nerve. The small sural nerve branch is isolated as well. The nerve is pulled distally to allow ligation with an absorbable suture. The sciatic nerve is quite large and has small vessels that can and do bleed. Ligation with an absorbable suture prevents this intraoperative and postoperative bleeding. Suture is inspected and then cut. The nerve is cleanly divided distal to the suture ligation with a knife. The nerve must retract proximally to prevent the distal end of the sciatic nerve from becoming adherent to areas of scar and pressure. Using a finger helps assure that the nerve is not tethered and has indeed retracted proximally 5 to 10 centimeters from the level of the bone cut and the flaps. The medial hamstring tendon and muscle are mobilized for myodesis. The tendon is pulled up through a proximal level in the posterior flap. This avoids tethering the subcutaneous tissue in the distal posterior medial flap and facilitates a better closure of the tissue layers. The tourniquet is let down and lap sponges are used for compression in early hemostasis. Tissues are inspected for areas of bleeding and hemostasis is obtained with electrocautery. Excessive periosteum may calcify and form irregular bone, therefore it is removed. This also exposes the distal femur for the myodesis drill holes. Irrigation of the tissues removes debris, bone dust, blood, and minimizes tissue contamination with bacteria. Note that the clamps are on the adductor muscle fascia and the medial hamstring tendon. They will both be myodesed to the femur. Fully removing the sterile tourniquet allows examination and mobilization of the proximal tissues. Examination of the large vessels assures the integrity of the ligation. The vessels can be seen pulsing. The forceps point to the areas on the lateral and anterior femur where the unicortical drill holes will be made for the sutures to be passed in and then out of the femur to act as myodesis points. Using a 2.5 millimeter drill bit, four unicortical drill holes are made in the distal femur. Irrigation is used to cool the drill bit. Suture is first passed from the outside of the cortex into the medullary canal. Suture is then easier to pass from inside the bone to the outer cortex using the blunt end of the needle as the sharp end often gets caught in the trabeculae of the bone. This suture is placed in the first and second drill holes starting medially. This is the most superior and anterior suture called the anterior suture. Suture A is clamped and the needle is left in place. A pointed bone clamp can be used to unblock the trabecular bone from the pathway into the drill hole. The second suture called the anterior lateral or AL suture is passed using the blunt end of the needle in order not to damage the first suture and weaken it. The sutures share space within the central two drill holes. This suture is placed in the second and third holes. The third or lateral suture is placed in the third and fourth drill holes. The medial hamstring tendon and muscle is mobilized. The anterior suture will be used to myodese the medial hamstring by suturing the tendon near the myotendinous junction. A locking Krakow suture technique is used within the tendon to obtain secure fixation and minimize devascularization of the tendon tissue.
After suturing the tendon with the anterior suture, the medial hamstring is myodesed up and over the distal femur. The myodesis is secured with a second pass of the suture through the tendon. After the myodesis is secure, the excessive tendon is removed and the tendon can be secured to the periosteum as well. The adductor muscle with its fascia is advanced over the distal end of the femur to illustrate where it goes and how the anterior lateral and lateral sutures will be used to secure two separate parts of the fascia for a secure myodesis. Before the adductor myodesis is performed, the posterior muscle fascia is brought up over the distal end of the femur and secured to the hamstring, tendon, and periosteum with absorbable suture. The illustration shows the placement and locking points with a Krakow technique suture used to secure the adductor tendon. First, the posterior and central area is secured, then the central area and anterior edge is secured. The lateral suture is placed through the adductor fascia, first securing the posterior edge of the fascia, and then crossing over and securing the central portion of the fascia. Again, the Krakow locking suture technique is used. The central or anterior lateral of the three sutures is identified. This suture is used to secure the central portion of the adductor fascia and then the anterior portion of the adductor fascia, again using the Krakow locking suture technique. The adductor is mobilized across the distal end of the femur and the suture advanced and tied. As one strand of the suture secures the tendon in a locking fashion, the suture must be tightened by advancing the free end of the suture through the drill hole in the femur and pulling the adductor fascia up and over the femur to secure it in place. Now the second suture is advanced and secured. Absorbable suture is used to secure the deep fascia of the quadriceps to the myodesis point by suturing it to the adductor fascia and periosteum. A second suture is placed to secure the deep fascia of the vastus lateralis, again to the myodesis area. Additional sutures are placed to secure the deep quadriceps fascia around the myodesis on the distal end of the femur and help keep the femur centralized within the muscle mass. In a transfemoral amputation, the greater trochanter and abductor muscle insertion remain normal, so abduction remains strong. The lesser trochanter and attachment of the iliopsoas tendon also remains normal, and therefore flexion remains strong. The main goals in a transfemoral myodesis is to try and restore some extension and some adductor strength to the limb. This helps rebalance the limb between flexion and extension and abduction and adduction. Here we are illustrating the test position of the flaps. The drain is brought out anterior and lateral position. The drain is cut between holes and placed deeply. Starting the fascial closure by bisecting the posterior muscle flap and then finding the central area of the quadriceps muscle and tendon to centralize the flap closure. Several of the central sutures are placed so that the layers are clearly identified and these sutures are tagged before tying to allow good visualization of the layers. After placing three or four sutures, the central area may be tied and secured.
the medial area of the flap is centered and the fascia closed. The lateral side of the flap is centered and closed. A secure fascial closure helps prevent muscle herniation and helps healing. Subcutaneous closure is performed with absorbable suture placed in a horizontal fashion. Excess skin may be trimmed using the scalpel. Rio nylon suture is used for a skin closure. drain is sewn in place to minimize the chance of the drain being pulled out, dislodged, or removed early. The leg is cleaned. Non-stick gauze is used and then 4x4's gauze are opened up and laid across the incision and then 1x1 one one laid over the wound. We try to avoid a large thickness of gauze that may become displaced and put pressure on the skin. Fluff gauze is used for padding and for compression. Curlex roll gauze are used to hold the loose gauze in place. An extra large 6 inch ace wrap is used to wrap the residual limb, being careful not to wrap circumferentially and cause too much compression. And the gauze is wrapped up around the waist in a spike of fashion in order to have the top edge of the gauze not roll down and become tourniquet like. This is the spike of wrap when it's completed. Tape is used to avoid having layers of the ace wrap become unraveled or roll down and become tourniquet-like. <laughs>